Everyone keeps asking, this is what it was like taking SQE2. If you didn't know, to become a solicitor in the UK, you have to pass what's called the SQE. And the SQE has two parts, SQE1 and SQE2. And each one has two parts. SQE2 has the written exams and the oral exams. I'm not gonna go too much into SQE1 as we'll be here for ages, but if you want me to do a separate video on that, I can obviously do that. I passed SQE1 in January. So with SQE2, you have 16 exams based on the six main skills of case and matter analysis, legal writing, legal drafting, legal research, advocacy, and client interviewing. You're also assessed on negotiation at points throughout certain ones of those skills, but there's no specific test on negotiation. Taking SQE2 was quite different to taking SQE1, and I was quite surprised at that. The written exams were more similar to the SQE1 exams, so they were still through a computer, but obviously it's no longer multiple choice. You're writing out answers in the different skills. I was in the same assessment center as I was in for SQE1 for the written exams for SQE2. You have three days back to back, four exams each day. You only have a 15 minute break for like the whole day, but the, the good thing is you do get out quite early. So you do have the rest of the day to unwind and then get back to revision for the next day. That's definitely the hardest part about SQE2, trying to get some motivation to revise for the next exams in between. With SQE1, I had like a week and a half in between the two exams to have time to decompress and start again. Whereas with SQE2, you have to just keep going, which is why it's like so draining. And especially with the orals, they come pretty quickly. I only had four days between the written finishing and the oral starting. So you don't really have time to just stop and unwind like you did with SQE1. I know by the third day of the written exams, people were struggling to kind of go through that cycle. There is a lot of knowledge that you need to retain. You need to retain all of your SQE1 knowledge practically, except for a few subjects like public law. And trying to kind of navigate that with also being able to write in the skills is a bit difficult. And also it's hard to kind of remember every single bit of knowledge. Sometimes with SQE1, you have a little bit of an aid in the fact that it's multiple choice as if you don't think of the answer straight away if you see the answer you can be reminded of the answer whereas with SQE2 you have to just remember everything so that's something that is different with SQE2 and I guess it does make it a little bit harder than SQE1 in that respect but I do think the actual process of taking the exams is less draining and less intense mm, less intense definitely because the days in themselves are shorter how I found those exams hello darkness my old friend Honestly, there was ups and downs. Some of it was okay. Like I was pleasantly surprised, but some of it was very difficult. Written exams, I actually felt they went generally okay. I was pretty happy with my performance. I know in some exams I didn't do as well, but I also think in some exams I did do better. So written exams, I was, pretty okay with. One thing I will say actually, I realized I'd reframed my thinking before going into these exams so that I could feel like this. So I reframed my thinking in a way that I was no longer focused on what if something comes up that I'm not prepared for because you have to come to grips with the fact that things are gonna come up that you're not prepared for, it's inevitable. Nobody goes into these exams and comes out of it with everything they knew coming up. It's just not, it's not realistic. So going into these exams, I'd particularly with drafting for example, I'd reframe my mind to go, well, I can't physically know every single type of form that could come up. It's not possible. And obviously in practice, you wouldn't need to do that. You would always have your precedence to help you out. And I will say I was worried about the potential that we wouldn't be given precedence. However, that didn't really seem like much of an issue. But basically going into the exams, I'd come out with this strategy of going, okay, well, if you don't structure your drafting or you don't put in the draft exactly what they would have put in, that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. At the end of the day, you don't need to get an A. You only need to get a C. In theory, you can fail so some exams as you only need to pass overall, not pass every single exam. If you want more explanation on that, I can give it because I know this was something that a lot of people went back and forth with. It took a lot of debate and consulting the SRA's website to actually figure out what the situation was with that, but you don't need to pass every single exam. So I can explain that in a separate video if you want it. So that's basically how I felt good leaving these exams. I know some people didn't feel good leaving the exams. You have to reframe your thinking as if you focus on tiny things that have gone wrong. I know, for example, in one of my attempts, I missed a tiny point of law, which would have elevated my answer. But overall, I still feel like I passed that answer. And that's the key point. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be at the level of a day one solicitor. That's another thing that I think people get really bogged down in and something that helped me with changing my mindset in the lead up to these exams. People are very nervous about the fact they're testing you to the level of a day one solicitor rather than the previous system, the LPC, testing you to the level of a trainee. Obviously, the difference with that being a trainee has two years to develop to become into a day one solicitor. And obviously for a lot of us, including myself, I'm not gonna be a solicitor after I pass these exams straight away. I still have to do my training contract. It does feel a little bit like 
Anyway, yes, it is a day one solicitor. It's no longer a trainee. It's a day one solicitor, not a partner. Your work is not expected to be flawless. Day one solicitors still make mistakes. Otherwise, there would be no need for a structure in a law firm. Humans make mistakes. So that's something that really helped me going into the exams. It lowered the pressure because I realized not everything needs to be perfect for you to pass. So that was how I felt with the writtens. The orals was a little bit of a different story. I had the dreaded 1240 slot. What that meant was, even though the oral exams are only two exams, so you've got your client interviewing exam and your advocacy exam, maximum of two hours worth of exams, I had to be in the building for seven hours. When you're not leaving until gone seven o'clock, you are absolutely exhausted. Most people in the 1240 sitting were not able to bring themselves to do more work in the evening because you're exhausted. You've been in a building for seven hours. It's physically and emotionally draining, especially when you're, you know, in such anticipation of these exams, everybody's stressing around you, you pick up on that energy and you know, it, it does drain you faster than if you were studying at home. I recently spoke on the keynote at Legal Cheeks conference to a whole load of law firms and universities and so many other organizations who weren't quite aware of this 1240 slot. But one thing I will say, I know a lot of people are panicking about it for future sittings. I don't think it's gonna last in all honesty. There was overly negative feedback from everybody who was in the 1240 slot as it did feel like you were at a material disadvantage to people who could just go in the test center for maximum four hours and left, whereas we had to stay for seven hours and then you couldn't leave until after 7 p.m. and then you had to be back the next day. So, you know, it is a completely different situation and I really don't think it's gonna last for future sittings because I do think the SRA are gonna get a lot of feedback on it. So I don't think that's something you should worry about, honestly. If it does come up, you just have to make the most of it. I I was really, really not happy with it. But going into the exam, before I got to the exam, again, it came down to mindset. I had to take some time to be like, okay, this is what it is. I have no choice about it. I have no way to change it. I have to just do it. It becomes a case of ignore the negative aspect until afterwards. Cry later because right now we need to get through the exam. So how I actually found the exams. I will say, I don't think my orals went quite as well as the written exams. And that's because I felt like my client interviewing exams were railroaded by the actors. Let's start with advocacy. I felt like advocacy went well, honestly. I was really nervous for advocacy and I think most people were. But I think the general consensus with my sitting anyway was that it wasn't awful. The things that came up were things you could reasonably expect to come up. Sometimes it was a little bit in an unfamiliar way. It was a bit complex. It was never something that was like, well, I had no idea that this could even come up in advocacy. It always made sense, even though sometimes it was trickier. I felt quite prepared for my advocacy assessment. I do think they went well. Who knows? I won't know until August, so. Oh, that's another thing with SQE2. You don't get your results until like August. And I took it in beginning of May, which is about three months. Obviously with SQE1, you only had to wait six weeks. Whereas with SQE2, it's a much longer waiting period for your results. The only thing you can do really is just completely put it out of your mind and focus on something else because there's actually no way for you to stress for that long. You'll just raise your cortisol levels. Okay, anyway, I'm getting off topic. You have to wait a long time for your SQE2 results. It is what it is, just... Like I say, advocacy, I feel like it went well because it's solicitors who play the judges in advocacy, whereas with client interviewing, it's just paid actors. And I do feel like the solicitors didn't want you to fail. I'm not saying like they gave you stuff because they didn't, but they weren't trying to make it more stressful and unnecessarily terrifying than it already was. I had really thought that I was going to get grilled. I was going to get told that I had weak points because that was something, I don't know, I just assumed it could come up. And maybe it can, I'm not sure. They've been through it. They're not trying to gatekeep the profession. I feel like they're assessing you, they understand that you're going to be nervous, but it's more of a holistic approach to assessing with SQE2. More looking at overall, are you at the level of a day one solicitor? I really don't think they were that bad. Like I feel like it could have gone a lot worse. Client interviewing, however, I'm not very happy about, and I don't really want to talk about it in detail. The issue with all of the SQE oral sittings is that the actors and you know solicitors who play the judges and clients there's no way of standardizing how they treat people as in with clients how readily they give you information there's no way of standardizing how seriously they take their job to gatekeep the information and i think there was a disparity in the way that some people's clients acted and compared to others that was one thing about sq2 that really upset me was i felt like going into it i was least nervous about client interviewing and i think coming out of it client interviewing is where i did worst with all assessments there's areas where you can improve but i think I think there was a significant amount that came down to the actors that I got. I think that's just, it's a little bit unfair, but I guess that's kind of the point with the holistic approach of SQE2. I'm trying to stay positive about it because...
I think some clients in some centers were readily giving information, whereas some in other centers were not. But there's no way to standardize that. I feel like my actors were not fair, but maybe it was my skills. And this is the thing. Maybe I was not prepared. And, you know, reflecting on that, I think there was aspects that I wasn't prepared for. There was things I could have done to shape that experience more for myself. A client can be given a brief to be difficult or not to give information. And you can have a conversation with them, which I didn't do, which is something that I've reflected on. I'm like, well, that's maybe a tip going forward. You can have a conversation with them and take a step back and be like, look, I really understand your point of view, blah, blah, blah. However, I know you've got these issues and I really want to help you solve these today. It will be best if you just give me as much information as possible and I will refine it down. That would have been a great way to get out of the situation I was in. But of course, hindsight is everything. But now you know that for going into your exams. Basically, I do think the, the benefit of SQE2 is that you don't have to pass every assessment in theory. So like I say, I didn't like the way my client interviewing assessments went, but I really liked the way my advocacy assessments went. It's a bit of a balancing act. And that's the one thing that you've really got to stay. You've got to keep your head in the game for SQE2. Because if you do badly in an exam, or you feel you do badly, because a lot of the time you might not have actually done badly, you just think so. If you do feel like that, you need to remember that it's not the end of the world. There are other exams where you can bring up your scores. And that's my key takeaway with SQE2 is it's a bit of an odd experience. It's very different to anything that you might have done, but don't let that put you off from doing well. I know a lot of people said to me that they didn't want to go to their oral exams because they felt like they did so badly in the written exams. And I can't quite like get over that. I think I might have to do a whole separate video on it because I said to whoever DM'd me, um, if I saw their comments in time, I practically begged them. I said, please just go to the exams. If you don't go to that exam, what is the chance that you get 0% and that you fail? It's 100% likelihood, right? If you don't go, you're going to fail the exam. And you know, you've passed SQE1 or you've done the LPC and you've got an exemption. So you know that you know some law, right? And you're clearly not stupid. If you've made it through a degree, the LPC or SQE1, you clearly have a brain. So you would have some level of skills. So my point is, what's the likelihood that you'll do better by going compared to if you didn't go at all? It's 100 percent likely. If you don't go at all, you're getting zero. That's 100% accurate. And it's probably going to be really difficult if you don't go to your oral exams to pass SQE2. I don't see it being possible. Honestly, it's not pass or fail. There's a range within and you get points. Even if you fail, you can still get points. And that's the key to all of this. Not going to an exam. I said I wouldn't talk about this. <laughs> not going to an exam would mean that you do fail. And having a zero is much harder to come back from than having a 50 out of 100. That's my biggest thing with SQE2. You've got to keep your head in the game. It is a different difficult situation, especially when you're going back to back. It's difficult, you know, it's difficult to keep going. You've really got to, it's a mental game as much as it is a physical game. But I will say overall, I feel better about SQE2 than SQE1. With SQE1, you had to get the law right. If you didn't get it right, you failed. With SQE2, you get points for marks. I just said you get points for marks. You get points for skills. Half of the marks you get are for the skills that you exercise. Even if you are terrible at the law. You've forgotten everything. You don't know anything about business law. They ask you about buyback of shares and you've just forgotten everything. You've forgotten what a share is. You can still, in theory, get 50% on that assessment. That's something that you do need to keep in mind if you're taking SQE2. Don't count yourself out of the game at any point. These exams are draining. Like, I know how negative I felt in, like, November of last year. It's a draining, draining, draining process to go through. It's awful. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But the thing is, you have to do it. I'm not saying you can't have negative days. Everybody has negative days. I have negative days. If you don't have a negative day, you're not a human. My point is, is overall, you need to focus your energy in a positive way. The SQE is already draining you. If you are negative, there's no positivity to drain from you. Confidence is everything, especially with oral exams. With advocacy, when I walked into the room, I was nervous. I was shaking. I was sweating. Like, it was horrible. But I didn't show that. It's a performance, right? Advocacy, it's a performance. Client interviewing, it's a performance. If a client comes to you in future and you are nervous, this is a complex case, you're really new, the partner's just dumped this on your desk and said, deal with it. You're not then going to walk into that client meeting and go, nice to meet you. You're not going to be nervous. You need to go in and you can be like, right, I need to convince this client that I know what I'm doing. And it's exactly the same for these exams. Your confidence can get you points. Obviously, you're going to be nervous and obviously nerves are going to come out. They can sift through that. But if you present an overly confident front, I'm not wrong and strong, okay? Although, no. <laughs> the point is, when I walked through the door, I pushed that door open with confidence. I walked into that room. I said, good afternoon, judge. And I got on with my submissions. I didn't spend time thinking, oh my God, there's a real solicitor in front of me. I got on with it. And I'm telling you, confidence is the way to do well in these exams. Because if you're not confident, it comes across. And especially with the oral skills, it's so, so, so important to present a confident front. Especially with client interviewing. I know I said I didn't do as well in client interviewing, in my opinion. But who knows? But the point is, even in client interviewing, if you're not confident, 
That client is not going to trust you. If that client doesn't trust you, that's one of the SQE marking criteria. You are going to lose points if you're not confident and you don't instill confidence within the client because you can't build a relationship of trust and confidence with the client if you're not confident with yourself. And I'm not saying you need to be confident because I'm telling you I wasn't, especially on the first day. But you push that door. I imagined like an imaginary hand on the back of my back pushing me through the door. And once you go in, there's no turning back. And what's the worst that can happen? You don't pass the exam, okay. Once you're there, it's like, okay, I've got to this far. I might as well just give it my best shot and have fun. One thing I did do is I, I did have fun in my advocacy assessments. Like even though I, I thought going into the SQE, I was gonna hate advocacy. And if you just scroll back through my videos, you can see how much I hated advocacy going through it. I actually really enjoyed it. It actually went fine because I presented a confident front. That was my experience with SQE2. Like I say, overall, I actually do feel like it went okay. I think it could have gone a lot worse. I think I was expecting a lot worse, but I feel like I felt a lot worse after SQE1. I do genuinely feel like SQE2 is not as scary as SQE1. I don't think it's as intensive as SQE1 in preparing for it either. It's just about revising that law. Once you get it, you get it. You don't need to be perfect and you only need to meet the standard of a day one solicitor, not the standard of a partner. So my key takeaways for SQE2 is that it went better than expected, a lot better than expected. It was not like SQE1. Some exams were difficult, some were okay. You don't need to pass every single exam in theory. You only need to pass overall. The difficult part of SQE2 is keeping your head in the right space because especially in the written exams when you've got three back-to-back -back days, by day three you're drained and trying to do work in between is next to impossible. But SQE2, like the whole SQE, is a mental game. If you take away nothing from this video, it's all about your headspace and the mental space that you put yourself in for these exams. I know this was a very, very long video. I hope it helped and let me know if you have any more questions about the SQE or anything else in general.